You are now listening to United 96 Podcast on the RFK Refugees Podcast Network. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. United 96 here on the RFK Refugees Podcast Network. Ted here. John is unfortunately not here, um, but we didn't want to go too long without giving you guys a podcast. Though we have we have not been away. We have been we have been around. We just did a I just did a uh a wonderful watch along. And the person who helped me build that out and make it look all nice and pretty uh is sitting with us right here. Brian. Uh Brian Kane joining us. Producer Brian, as we call him, is joining us, uh giving us his voice. Brian, how you doing, my friend? Welcome in. Uh I'm doing well, Ted. I'm I'm not doing as well as I would had a couple of fixtures last week uh, gone more away. Um, but we're, we're not, uh, I guess we're, I guess we're in the woods. We're, we're, we're not, we're not out of the woods yet, uh, but, but we're in the playoff woods um, uh, looking for, for, for a path in. That was, a, I'm, I'm doing a really good impression of John with my bad analogies over here. Um, so how are you? Yeah, this is the part where we get to rip on John. I'm doing well. I am. Um, I, Somehow managed to see myself through that watch along. I, I am not a smart person. Let me just say that I'm I I some I have things I have intelligent things in my brain, but my common sense sometimes gets the better of me. In and so I thought I was still, you know, 22. So I thought, oh, I can I can referee three soccer games, uh, two of which were full 90 minute games um, where I'm chasing around uh, 16, 17 year old uh, kids as I'm trying to keep up with play. Uh, and then I can, you know, no nap. I, I took no nap. Um, I can, I can just jump on into a watch along. Um, and towards the end there, I was starting to to watch along at 10:30 p.m. By the way, so I'm not a smart person, but I still had a lot of fun. I feel like it gave me some energy. I hope I wasn't too. I hope by the end I wasn't too like sounding like I was either uh, drunk or falling asleep uh, towards the end there. Might have been dragging there a little bit, but at least it was an exciting game. It could have been a real bad zero zero draw. But, uh, but yeah, I did that. That was fun. I think uh, we're, we're talking possibly. I think that was enough fun. Um, I'm looking at doing it for for Wednesday. Um, we'll see if John John is currently, I said, feeling under the weather. So if he's feeling better. Maybe he'll he'll make an appearance. But um, but that was fun. I think that's something we're going to we're going to look at in the future. We, we're all we're all sickos who watch this this team as it muddles its way to either eighth or ninth or out of the playoffs uh, that we stay up at 1030 on a Saturday night. When other people are doing much cooler things, I'm sure. <laughs> like sleeping. <laughs> like sleeping, exactly. My my wife was dead asleep when I walked in. So anyway, uh, let's get into it, DC United. Now, we, we did not really, I don't think we've really provided some coverage. We're going to go back a little bit. I don't think we've provided much coverage of DC United, New York Red Bulls, um, a, a disappointing result. I, I feel like the two results here have really kind of been a microcosm. The the result against Red Bulls and the result against Vancouver have really kind of been a microcosm of DC United season. It's like on the road, they like go up against some like, you know, upper level teams and they go up and they pick up results and they and they get enough to do well. I haven't looked. I want to look. I was going to try to look at their like how they're doing uh, as far as like home and away. But I feel like their away record, which you know, no team does has a has a great away record, unless you're like maybe a top team, um, you're semi decent. But most of your losses, the front end of your losses, usually happen, um, you know, on the road, and then you just got to be good at home. Well, DC has done the opposite. They've been decent on the road. They've picked up some results. This this game was no exception. Uh, the two two sorry the two two draw against uh, Vancouver we saw, but at home it's like it just kind of either falls apart. Or it's been disappointing, and I, I have to look at their record. But I think they have like a they have to have a losing record at at home at this point. I'd have to go yeah, look it up real quick. Yeah, I'm I'm taking a look right now. Um, I'm going to tell you it's it's not pretty either way. Um, the the season really started tough um, away, uh, and has gotten slightly better. Although although it's really. Um, I don't know. It's 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 not good either way. Um, more losses on the road, uh, fewer draws. Uh, we we do a little bit better job of drawing at home, uh, but wins are scarce on both sides. Um, so it's 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 not pretty ten. Yeah, I mean, you look. They are currently they are four wins, four draws, eight losses on the road, negative nine goal differential. That's not great, uh, but it's better than the Columbus Crew. It's better than New England Revolution. 
It's only they are tied with points with Atlanta United. They are one point off Nashville. Two, uh, was it uh, three points off Philly for third? Uh, and then Orlando and Cincy are kind of running away with it. And then their home record is very much near the bottom at 13th um, with 21 points. They have five wins, uh, six draws and five losses. So that's not good enough for a team trying to trying to make the playoffs and trying to be they pick up, you know, a couple of those draws into wins. They turn a couple of those losses into draws. We're looking at an entirely different season. Um, I think this has been a a season of missed opportunities and chief among them, I think, if we point to a game where I, I think all of us around were just kind of like, I think the playoffs are done. It was, I, in my opinion, it was after this game. I was like, that's it. This is over. Um, I'll get into maybe why that's not the case, but it's certainly um, because everybody else seems to be tripping over themselves. And maybe I should have expected that. Uh, but this was a frustrating game in the sense. Number one, Christian Mateke gets a hat trick. He gets three goals. He gets a, a off a set piece. He wins a header. Uh, first of all, I mean, hats off to the fans that came out blistering hurricane level conditions. It looked like absolutely miserable to be out there and it looked like every team's attack wanted to be there and nobody on defense wanted to actually defend on that day, which maybe is something to be expected. But um, I think the win was was doing some some funky things. Uh, a lot of the goals came off either set pieces or crosses that I think kind of hung a little bit. Um, DC did not get off to a good start. I thought particularly I think there was some. We had uh, Brendan Heinzeich and Donovan Pines central defense. Uh, first goal, I am putting it a lot on Brendan Heinzeich because he tries to dive down for a header. And I feel like if he stands, stays on his feet, stands up, reaches out, and and pushes himself forward with, with his leg instead of trying to dive at it with his head, I think he either wins contact or he wins a foul. Um, so first goal, not great. Uh, give credit to Christian Benteke finds the back of the net on a, on a nice little looped header. Um, and then basically what I'm going to call uh, a tribute to the Washington capitals on a stuff attempt where he literally just stuffs the ball into the back of the net. Little question as to whether that was Matias. I've kind of watched the replay. I don't know whether that was Matias click or Christian Benteke. Um, and DC's up two one. And I think that first half, if they go into that half with a lead, I think maybe they can see this game out because I think the game kind of settled down a little bit in the second half. Um, but they just could not keep themselves off the score sheet. Obviously, we have the penalty call. Um, a rough call, but I think once the once the rage died down, uh, it was you know, unfortunately it was Chris Dorkin on that, um, who's had a bit of an up and down time. He makes contact, you make contact, that's a PK. We'll get into the, another PK call coming up against Vancouver. But overall, I mean, it was a weird, wild game. So you can almost maybe write it off, but you also have to look at the importance. I mean, when your star attacker scores a hat trick, you normally expect to win the game. And DC did not. The second half, they gave up. I, I kind of thought in that game, I was like, whoever gets the next goal, I don't think this is going to end tie. Whoever gets the ne- next goal, I think is going to win this game. And uh, to to New York's credit, they went and got the, the, got the goal in the second half. Um, I thought really too the backbreaker for DC also was they were up three they got up three two on the Benteke PK so you almost wash out that other PK attempt and then literally you give up a goal right before halftime and you go in three three and it's just like I I because we worry about this team's depth and this team has no depth and mm-hmm. it's just yeah, so it was just a mess of a game I don't know you have anything any other thoughts you have about this game other than it just being just a giant mess. And might ultimately cost this cost this team a chance at at making the playoffs. Yeah, you know, I I think um, certainly if you penciled in a a game that DC would have really helped a lot down the stretch, this would have been one that you expected to like take three points from. Um, fact that we left with zero um in conditions that that you have to think under those sort of weather conditions at home that 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 added more in favor of uh of dc and given you know some of been techies i wouldn't say say struggles but you know um for where he's at you know one off the golden boot race 
Um, he, he, he could, could very he could very well win the Golden Boot race. He could pull an Ola Kamara in 2021. He could win the mm-hmm. Golden Boot race and DC miss out on the playoffs. Absolutely could and, happen. And with the chances he's had, he probably should be l- leading the Golden Boot race. I was looking at some stats and, and one of the, the obscure ones that DC is up in the top of the league is is touches in the opponent's penalty box or third in touches in the opponent's penalty box. Um, our XG is not up, so so the quality is missing. Um, and I know that we've talked about that before on the show, but you know, just really disappointing to have that game, uh, you know, end with with no points for DC. And you know, I think uh, maybe with a little bit more confidence, um, we wouldn't have started uh, the Vancouver game uh, the way we did. Yeah, yeah. Um... And I think it's interesting you bring up, I mean, a lot of these have sort of advanced metrics. I'll talk into another player uh, that I I think uh, Rich, who's a, a longtime contributor to the show, do, does not really like. And I, I personally think he's done done a great job. And there was an interesting stat from Brendan Cartwright, which I'll get into a little bit once we once we get to his goal. But um, I mean, other than that, I mean, this was kind of a mess. It was a mess of a game. I guess this is a game I kind of look to. This is where if I had to make an argument, if if I'm if I'm sitting at the end of the year in the playoffs, out of the playoffs, you know, make the play in game, lose it, you know, maybe or make a run in the playoffs that I mean that changes it completely. But if the season goes the way it's going and I'm looking at it, a game where I'm like, I don't think I don't think you want Wayne Rooney back. In my opinion, it's kind of these this type of game or these types of moments where you know, you expect the team to to be up to be up for it and you expect the team to be willing to to go for it. You know, it's a home game. You know, I, I think back, I, I looked at this game and it's like, wow, here's a here's a crucial here's a crucial playoff game for playoff position between DC United and and the Red Bulls. It's a game in which uh it's after a hurricane and it has huge playoff implications. It it sort of feels like a a baby version of that 2012 playoff game. Like this, this is a, this is a game against the rebels that had more importance than any game against the Red Bulls. Not the fact that it was just a rival. Um, and I really look at this and I'm like, I'm like, Wayne, like what's, what's, what's going on here? Because, you know, I, I think back to, to, to that season two in 2012. And I think it was that season. It was the mentality that Ben Olsen established. And, and maybe we're, we're going to get maybe to a little bit about him too, as, as he, emerges an open cup winner, but he established a mentality where he was like, look, we are going to make RFK our fortress. And I feel like I, I, I feel like there's maybe, I feel like Wayne certainly is a, is a player's seems like a player's coach. It seems like a players are mostly happy with him. If he comes back next year, I don't think there's going to be, you know, any type of locker room revolt, but I kind of look at this and I'm like, you know, this was like a big, important game. And e- even in the press conferences, I kind of feel like, oh, well, we got to go do this. And then that doesn't happen. It's like, okay, well, we got it. And it's just kind of like, and even, you know, when they, uh, Brendan Hikes interview with Ted was like, well, you know, yeah, we kind of, we kind of let that home game slip away. We weren't able to pick mm-hmm. up the points against it, but we tied uh, Charlotte. So it kind of evens out. And it's like, no, man, you go out. Yeah. You got to win your home games. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I think if I were to describe, like Wayne's coaching style from what we've seen. He's a system coach, right? Like he is a, this is the system we're going to play. This is the system I'm going to set up. This is the system we're going to run. And um, yeah, I think there are a lot of things that exemplify that. I think the Heinzeich interview in the, hey, essentially we sat down and planned out the season. Um, I think that if there was a stat for, coach butt in seat time um wayne would lead that by far like you i you know i think he sets things up for this is how we're going to play this is a system we're going to run and lets that go like i I don't think um you know from ernan to wayne you couldn't have had two more opposite in terms of like on the sidelines getting fired up and you know i you know i i wonder if that's something that that wayne could add to his game because he's he's a strong personality and those type of games where you know you things are flying both directions you 
want your coach in those moments to become a part of it, to really like lead in the moment. And I would say if there's anything that I feel like maybe Wayne lacks, at least visibly to us as the viewers, it's all we have to go off of, is that sort of in the moment leadership that, hey, I need to change something. I need to think differently. I need to, you know, switch things up a bit. I don't think we see a lot of that. I think he's very much, this is a team that, yes, is incomplete, does not have all the pieces we need. This is the system we're going to play. And the system works or it doesn't, but we don't see many changes to the system. Outside of the difference, you know, throughout the year between a three-back and a four-back system, um, you know, within a game, you don't see uh, much tactical change as much as you do, you know, like for like. Um, changes. I, I would I would disagree with there a little bit just because I think I, I do w- the good things I see from Wayne is the practical recognition, which I think is an underrated it's an underrated skill um in, in a coach is is practical recognition of what you have versus what you want. And it's the realization sometimes where you can try something early on in the year and think this is the way I want this team to play. This is the way I think it can work. And the the coaches that survive and get through it are the ones that say, you know, unless you're Man City and you can buy or Liverpool and you can literally buy the player, you can you can assure yourself you're going to get the players the way your system's going to play. If you're not managing one of those big time clubs that has an unlimited funds and you're playing particularly also in a salary cap league, it's effective to be a coach that can be uh, that can change up their system. So, you know, we bring in Lewis O'Brien. He's a great talent. Um, I think there was a question to me. I was like, where does he fit in this team? He's not, he sort of seems like a duplicate of click. Well, the solution was, okay, well, we're going to use Benteke as a fulcrum. And when we had taxi here, taxi would also be there. And we're going to kind of have players sort of bleed off him. Um, we're going to play a really high line and we're going to like keep, try to pin the ball into the, into the team's opposing half with long balls and kind of use Benteke as that. Um, and to, to his credit, it kind of worked for a little bit. And then, you know, you know, taxi's gone, everything gets away. Tegu to Pietra comes back healthy. And then we've seen the team kind of switch. So, and I don't know if that's him or if that's his assistant coaches. He obviously brought in uh, Pete Shuttleworth, who's been a long time assistant coach. You know, we don't know the ins and outs of who's bringing the tactical mindset, but I mean, we only can really go based off who's the head coach and that's Wayne. I think we have seen this team adjust and the way they play right now is to me, a much better and much more attractive style than what we've seen. It's just, it's one of those things is too little too late. If they had had this team set up, I think they would have definitely positioned themselves into, into that ninth spot or eighth or ninth spot comfortably in the playoffs um, with the way we've seen this team play and, and the way they look in the attack with, with Ted Cudi Pietro um, who had a, a very sneaky good game. Um, I think he hasn't had the moments I think that we see, but I think we still see some things from him. Even that, um, that New York game, I didn't come away thinking that he played very well um, in that game, but I thought he played a little better in Vancouver. I saw a little more, um, little, some chances out of him. Um, Pirani's getting there. It's still a little bit rough, a little bit raw with him. Um, I'd be curious. I, I'm still waiting. I, I want some, want some outside analysis on him. I want somebody from the outside to tell me that what I'm seeing, and I don't just have rose colored glasses. That's that's the big thing um, with him. But I don't know. Can, I, don't, can I, I yeah. Can I can I give you my favorite uh, Pirani stat? What's that? <laughs> he he is uh, second on the team. Not not in not in per ninety, but for the season on uh, carries into the penalty box. <laughs> That's wild. So, uh, second behind Benteke on carries in the penalty box. I think, um, you know, I, I kind of like you. I'm I'm interested in third party assessment, but it's it's been a long time since I've been been this sure of extending a, a loan deal uh, and making yeah. it permanent. Yeah, I mean, really, for me, since since sort of the the back half of Acosta's year, where he kind of came mm-hmm. onto the scene, I think we've seen enough. He, like I said, he fills that U twenty two spot. It should be a, a done deal. Uh, let's get into the to the Vancouver game. Another weird game. Uh, road trip, ten thirty p.m. game. Uh, definitely some MLS after dark vibes from this game. Uh, DC United give up an early goal. I Pedro Santos, I think, kind of loses his man on this one. I think Pedro Santos. Probably if you had to pinpoint a player who had the roughest game, um, mm-hmm. it was probably Pedro Santos out there. Uh, it's 
it's becoming clear. It seems to me that Wayne was like, I need to rest. I, Eric Davis is, is certainly proven himself to be a better player than, than what we've seen from, and Pedro Santos has lost a step, but I can't, I, I have like three games I need to manage here. I've got players. It was pretty clear to me. It's like, this is a game where we need to put our best foot forward. We can't just, you know, punt it or try to hold on to a, to a draw. So, you know, Benteke is going to go out there. Tecu de Pietro is going to go out there. Perandi is going to go out there. All, you know, all the guys clicks going to be out there, all the guys that you want. And then it's like, all right, now who can I maybe drop in and sub? And we will suffer a little bit. One of the choices was made for him with, um, Russell Canals picking up yellows. And then it's like, all right, well, I'm going to slot in Ruan instead of Nahar because it's turf. So I don't want to, I don't want to push, push Nahar too much. Um, I'm going to drop in Davis. Uh, I'm going to play Heinz Eich and I'm going to play uh, Derek Williams. And, you know, maybe then we'll we'll rotate a little bit with maybe Birnbaum. We'll, I wouldn't be shocked if Birnbaum plays next Wednesday and maybe Pines goes back to the bench. Um, it was definitely like it's a it's basically like, where can I rotate um, the same issues? But I guess the good thing is that they got a goal. They got at least a goal in the first half, which has been a rarity um, mm-hmm. for this team. But. First goal is not great. Early goal to give up. You're already putting yourself into a hole. Uh, you're just thankful that uh, New England, I'm sorry, New England, uh, Vancouver then just gift you another goal, a a sort of weak bounce pass, but full credit to Tegu Di Pietro. He makes the move, steps up, wins the ball, and then lays it off right to Benteke who scores. So um, it's a gift, but it's a gift that you capitalize on. And it's some, it's a gift that this team sometimes has not been able to capitalize on this year. So I, I think full yeah. credit to Ted on that one. Yeah, we, we, we haven't been cashing in enough of those. That isn't, <laughs> there, there's been enough gimmies that we haven't got that, mm-hmm. that we came do. Yeah. Uh, on, on the Vancouver goal, you know, I don't think you could have had uh, more of like a phone in from the announcers on that one. <laughs> they 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 spent the whole lead up talking about how nobody scored more first minute goals and uh or, or like like for goals in the first five minutes than Vancouver this season. And uh Brian White also leads the league in headed goals. So it was uh it was exactly as Vancouver planned it. And I think if anything highlights a little bit of um where DC struggles is when a team has a plan. We, we struggle to get them out of that plan and disrupt that plan. Uh, and, and I think we saw that against Vancouver. Yeah, I would say first, I mean, I would say this game was mostly tilted towards Vancouver. Um, and, you know, it's certainly uh, it, it was certainly that first half uh, was mm-hmm. I, don't think, I don't think really many teams, re- either team really developed many other chances from that. I think there was one maybe uh, there was one kind of break. I remember there was one big breakdown where I think the team got kind of caught up pressing. And then it was, uh, I believe, I want to say it was like click or it was somebody I was not expecting to be back, kind of having to be a single man on a two on one, basically, with the goalkeeper. And fortunately for for D.C., Vancouver very much flubbed that opportunity uh, because that could have been an easy goal. Other than that, there wasn't too much of a difference. there wasn't too too many other opportunities really for either side. I think maybe DC had one, maybe small little uh, half chance. I think it was maybe a nice little run, um, nice little run from from Teku to Pietro that uh, I think nearly found Benteke for the goal. So, but other than that, not a whole lot from either side. It's you know one one going into the half. Uh, you know, you're thinking can can you maybe find a way to sneak a, sneak three points in this game and um, and the se- and then. Uh, the game very much sort of started to turn bad and I would started to get very worried whether this team would find anything of the sort of, of a goal or anything uh, when particularly they pick up another, another bad PK call. Um, it, I think you gotta, you gotta look at that as a harsh call. It, it's funny. It's really funny because I think I, tw- and I think I tweeted this out earlier, but uh, basically an identical thing happened in the premier league who is currently suffering some horrible referee decisions, particularly after the, after the Liverpool game, uh, which I am biased. So, you know, I'm sure some Tottenham fans are like, yeah, that was fine. What are, what are you talking about? But anyway, um, but uh, Pedro Santos uh, gets the ball out, makes sort of makes a, a touch out 
it's on turf, maybe gets away from a little bit. The Vancouver attacker, I think that was that Brian Wright who came in on that. I forget who it was. Yes, it was Brian White. Yeah, Brian White comes in. He's trying to basically then touch the ball out and clear it. Brian Wright wins the ball. The clearance goes out. It doesn't initially get called a PK or anything. And then it goes to VAR, gets reviewed, comes back. It is a PK. Uh, DC then go down 2-1. Bono, to his credit, nearly gets to that. And I think if he saves that, maybe that's a game. We come back right down the other way. We get a goal from Click, and suddenly we're 2-1 up. And maybe we we see this one out. And we're having a completely different conversation about where this team is at this point. Um, but it doesn't yeah. happen. You, you, you know, I, I, I think, um, you, you know, you mentioned the, this penalty kick here. And, you know, we've talked about VAR before, and this is one of those examples where you you start to question the, like, scientific nature of VAR, right? Uh, you know, you say, you know, for, for the center to go over and overturn this, you clear and obvious, like... If you sure, if you'd called it a PK on the field, because you know, I I I don't doubt that the ref saw Santos control the ball, saw um, Brian White step in front of Santos and knock the ball away, and then Brian White fell down. Right? You know, um, there's there's no deliberative action from Santos to. Uh, it's not like he's coming in from behind on Brian White. Um, the action is away and, and well away from goal. Um, and the result is that, you know, on discretion, it's, it's essentially because, Brian, because Pedro Santos is standing still and Brian White is running, um, you know, Brian White gets a, gets a half step in front of Pedro Santos, um, probably gets a, uh, a uh, a gust of cold air uh, on his calves and uh, and goes to ground inside the area, which he has the right to do. Um, but you know, this is definitely one of those ones I I, I think without the advent of slow mo, and you know, um, you know if you, you if you you know if the ref had his phone uh, and he was looking at it in full speed on the replay, it, the call would have stood. Um, so I, I agree. I think it's a bit harsh, um, but. Uh, but but that that's the way it goes. My my biggest thing about my biggest thing about penalties in general, I, I think we're heading towards I, I don't know if we'll see this happen because I think there will be there will, there's maybe a certain argument amongst the executives that run the sport in FIFA is like, well, this leads to more goals. So there's more moments like this. But I feel like with VAR, we're seeing I'm I'm sure if we looked at penalty calls pre VAR penalty calls post VAR I am sure we have seen a massive increase and you know maybe we haven't some of that maybe is driven to by referees like holding the whistle and saying I'm not sure about that you know it, before they would be like well I'm about I'm semi sure that's a PK I think I'm going to call it I'm going to call it and then now referees like well unless I am 100% sure I am not calling it and I will just let VAR you know save me in that in that regard but I, I have a feeling like we would probably see an increase um, in, in PK calls versus um, versus no VAR. I think what what we're with the what gives me hope is we have this huge invent in sports analytics. You've just dropped a lot of different sports analytic quotes, and and there was an article from the Athletic that illustrated how much like how much of a XG gain you get from PKs and moments like that. I I would love it if I think it's time if I was advocating and I would say one rule I would change for IFAP I would say no PKs and P, the PK in the box is done like you foul in the box the question's going to be is it a clear and obvious goal scoring opportunity if it is PK absolutely go ahead and give it there's a high enough chance you you you're already given the yellow for you've already removed the red maybe you bring that back at this point um but if it is a foul in the box and it is not a obvious, a clear goal scoring opportunity, you don't just get a free shot at the net. Then you basically you get a direct kick from that spot. If it's inside the six, it is dragged out to perpendicular to the penalty slot. So you just kind of drag it out there. Um, and it's basically like a direct free kick play. 
Um, and I think that would be a much better solution than just giving a PK just because a player, you know, is able to cut around the box and, and draw a foul. And you can see game where games kind of change that way. So that's my thought on it. Um, I don't know if it'll ever happen. I feel like maybe we're heading towards that heading towards that route, uh, maybe with all these VAR decisions and, and things changing. I don't know. We'll see. People also like yeah. goals. And that's that yeah. may, maybe the one thing that where this doesn't happen. Yeah, I I, th- I think your first inclination there that, you know, by and large, um, people like goals. Uh, the the sport continues to grow globally. Um, it's sort of like like uh, any press is good press. Mm-hmm. Um, so would you rather have a, you know, 2-2 draw with some controversy or, you know... Um, a a a two one uh d c you know win with without much to say yeah so I, you know I, yeah it's gonna be the big, it, big the big thing is gonna be if goals go down interest maybe starts to go down so C- counterpoint in, in, instead of like an, an a direct kick um in those sort of situations you bring back um <laughs> the the m l s you know from the center circle. The MLS um, shootout. Yes, yes. See, I, this is this is an underrated thing that you know. I, you mentioned Premier League and everything that uh, uh, the PGMOL is uh, is going through right now. This could be a saving grace because because I, I feel like European leagues right now would just eat that up. Yeah, I, I well, we'll see. I I think there were some players. There have been some players who participated in it. So all the players in the in, in the NASL loved it, and then all the players in MLS were like, "No, we hated that stuff because we got there were injuries and chances." I think that could be the one thing. I think there's ways to work around it. I think if you if you make it sort of where you have to line up and shoot, and if you know there's any type of collision, you know the it's a miss, so it incentivizes the player to you know, shoot the ball or take a shot and not really try to dribble in. You know, there's a lot of other things. We'll see. Um, we'll see. Uh, two, two draw though for, for DC. We, uh, we should mention to Mateus click, um, a ball over the top. I kind of looked, uh, so tech QD Pietro definitely gets the assist on the, on the Mateke goal, but he is, uh, according to foot mob, I don't know if ML, what MLS stats said. He does not get the assist for Mateus's clicks goal. I guess because that, I think that took maybe a little bit of deflection. Um, he kind of plays the ball into the box. Maybe it takes a deflection off the, the left or right. Like, I don't know. I think he should get some credit for it. He, he sees the opportunity and gets it. But the ball kind of drops over to Click, who hammers it home. Shout out to Leeds fans juicing up the MLS goal of the week. I do not think they will win. I think St. Louis fans have fully jumped on. Probably some other MLS fans as well. The, the Klaus goal was pretty good this week um, as he sort of jumped into the and buried the ball in the back of the net. And a really, really nice shot. Um, worthy of a goal of the week. I'm still going to vote for Matias Click. Uh, but Matias Click, uh, three goals, nine assists. And uh, Brandon Cartwright, I have to give credit, drops the stat. Uh, he has now passed uh, uh, Edison Flores on goals and assists over his career. <laughs> so not, not a great comparison. Um, but I think it illustrates that, I mean, three goals, nine assists. I mean, I probably would have taken that from a TS click start of the year. I would say, yeah, that's that's a decent, decent run of the season. Um, you know, I think considering his role change, considering the team, I don't think he was playing his best role throughout the entire season. Um, and, you know, I, I found it interesting, too. There was a I think a little uh, there was a transfer transfer room um, moment or transfer room. I think there's like some sort of summit where teams meet and basically they can start to talk about deals. And, and uh, Stuart Mares was there talking about the transfer of Matias click and said, well, they needed, we needed a number eight. So it said to me, Oh, they didn't actually really envision click as a number eight. It seemed to me that maybe that was always the plan. We're going to try to get a number 10 because we know that, you know, and then they got Lewis O'Brien and that probably changed some things um, about what they looked for. And then they got the summer so I don't know. I mean, if this team goes forward with Rooney with another coach, I mean, a spine of, of of having click in that natural role, he's already I think he was already top as far as chances created. To me, he is worth he is worth he's been worth the price of admission. He's worth a DP salary. He is what, 32. So he'll be 33 next year. 
that's certainly not young, but it's also, I think with the role he plays, I'm not necessarily concerned about his, about his, uh, so he's born June 3rd, 1990. So he is, yeah, so he'll he's, be, he's 33 he's now. 30, 33. Sorry. Yeah. 34. Uh, around the start of next season. I mean, we've seen, we've seen plenty of players though, who play that kind of eight role. If he can, if you get a bunch of young guys around him, I mean, plenty of players, skilled players have gone through and played 34, 35, um, in MLS. That's certainly not out of the equation. Uh, you know, they're, I could, I'm trying to like think I'm sure there's a Dax McCarty. He's in his thirties and still can do sort of that sort of hybrid role that he does. So I, I, I think he's shown enough. I want to see a little more of him next year. Um, you build a younger team around him. You build a, you get guys like Pirani that can run. Um, I think I, I think I want to see him here next year. Um, and I think he's through, got a contract through, so I think we will see him. So regardless of who the coach is. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's not one of those guys that you notice that he's, he's 33, right? You know, maybe another league, but you know, he could go, he could go at least one more season. Um, maybe more Pro- probably, I, you know, I, I, I don't think you look to extend him beyond next year. Uh, mm-hmm. if you do, certainly not in a DP slot. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say yeah. with any of these guys, I think the market of with 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 uh, Click and Benteke, I think both of them have done enough to earn a contract next year. I mean, Click's, I mean, Benteke's pushing the Golden Boot race. I don't see why you don't bring him back. This year has been already sort of blown up with the DP. You, you're going to have that DP slot open. You bring in Pirani. You've got that U22, and he takes up a U22 initiative spot. If he has to take up a young DP slot for reasons, then you still have that U twenty two initiative spot, um, but you can go out and get somebody. So to me, to me, it's a, it's neither here, neither. And you might even get another DP slot because the team, the rule, the league might be changing its rules. Um, let's talk about Pirani. Obviously, I I thought he played pretty decently. He he unfortunately gets the highlight in that he has the miss. Um, I think this has become maybe a little bit of a thing with shooting outside the box. Uh, he does did have a nice goal against Atlanta, so maybe we cut him a little bit of slack. It is on turf. I'm sure he's played on that in his youth, so maybe it's not much of an excuse than for maybe an older player. But you know, he's been play, he's been a pro for a little bit, so maybe it was a little bit he got his foot got come, caught underneath him for that. But um, something to watch. I think he's young enough. I'm still high on him as far as bringing him back. Uh, any reservations? Any any thoughts about how he played? I know you kind of already brought up the stat for dribbling in the final third. So at leading the team. And that is crazy to think about how long he's been. It also really shows how, how DC has played before he came here. <laughs> right. You know, I think, um, you know, I, he definitely brings something that I don't think anyone else in the team really has. Um, and, and really since, since taxi left that we've been missing, which is the ability mm-hmm to carry the ball forward you know i I think there's been some really promising play um you know i think is between him and benteke where you know benteke can really play that like holding forward role um if he can get some some finishing in there and really get some productivity out of his carries into the box you know i i i think he can He's he's got a lot of room to grow in his game, and mm-hmm. I think that's what I'm excited about. You know, there it's still a lot of potential right now, um, but you know, I like the potential that I see, and it certainly brings a different look than anything else we have on the team. I mean, like I, you know, he's he's a different type of player than Ted is. Um, you know, I think I, you know. Ted certainly can can move into the box, but you know I think he plays better in a passing situation as a distributor and a receiver. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like the, the 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 next person on the list and sort of like carries in the box is Dahomey, and you know I'd say that there's a wide gulf between what we see in Piranha and what we see in Dahomey. So um, you know I'm I'm excited. It would have been. This is like a player that would have been great to find back in April and mm-hmm. see what we have now. Um, but you know, uh, ho- hopefully, uh, maybe he can turn on these last two games and uh, and and help us see it in the postseason. 
Speaking of the next two games, obviously DC United on the road against Austin. Austin are probably in close to a free fall, as you can imagine. Uh, they have absolutely been in a rut. This is absolutely a game. You know, both teams are going to be desperate. Both teams are going to be looking for a win. Um, I think this could be this could be a real fun midweek match for the crazy people who want to see a crazy match. Um, Austin, but Austin have, have completely sunk um, as far as a team. There's talks about Josh Wolf potentially being under threat uh, this season. Basically, after after last season, where they were where you know they were chasing the top of the West, this has absolutely been. They started out okay, and then it just kind of has all sort of fallen apart. Um, so this is an opportunity for DC, I think, to come in and you know maybe pile on some misery um, and get a win. Uh, if you're looking at uh, if you have never checked out Sports Club stats. Dot com. Uh, this is my site I use when trying to come up with playoff permutations. Uh, if DC go out and win the next two matches, uh, they give them, they have their sort of what if analysis where basically you can, it, they sort of simulate everything and they basically try to determine what they think, you know, what you think your chances are of making the playoffs. If you, if you do this, they have a 94.7% chance if this team wins the next two games. If they pick up only a win and a draw, uh, it drops to 54%. If they lose uh, and win, it drops to 10%. So basically win the next two games, anything, a win and don't lose and pick up a, a at least one win, then you're flipping a coin as to whether this team can make it in. By the way, it also does give them, uh, if they win the next two games, it gives them a 60% chance of finishing in the eighth slot, which would be the hosted uh, home game. I mean, with the rest of the league sort of tripping over themselves, by the way, they give them an overall percentage of 26.1%. So one in four chance, which is not out of, so they are not, certainly not eliminated. I think it's a question. I think these next two games, this is a game where, you know, if you're tied, you're pulling up the keeper. I, and I, I think we could see both teams. If this game is tied and each team has a corner kick, I think we could have both teams pulling up their keeper, trying to go and get the win. Uh DC really can ill afford not to go out and win this game and pick up three points. And then obviously you have to win that home game. That game against NYCFC could be something, could be something big. I think it's all going to come down how they look on Wednesday. Wednesday, you might get some momentum and then you can kind of push forward. Um, I was looking at, I don't don't know if New York City FC have a game. I'm not seeing it on my schedule, but um, I probably can find it real quick if I can stall enough time. Um, and they do not. So they get a week break <laughs> and then, uh, and then DC gets a two week off. So we are literally finishing out the season. DC is finishing out the season and then we get two weeks off because MLS, MLS season makes sense. So, um, I, yeah. I think either, I, either way we're sweating on decision day. Um, if we're in that either eighth or ninth spot, we will, there'll be a bunch of permutations that need to happen. Yeah. I've never, um, yeah, as as we've gotten down towards the end of the season, it's it's not a good feeling to 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 not be a lock on decision day and also not <laughs> have a chance to do anything about it. Yeah, that's it's crazy. Um, I, we're gonna hopefully soon, I, but next year we're getting an expansion team, so maybe we'll have everybody playing on decision day. Um, I, I really wish MLS would just go to. If you're going to expand, just make sure it's two teams or, you know, make sure you can get an even number of teams because it just kind of stinks. And also it's like in D.C. will basically have. So if they by some, you know, I don't want to call it a miracle because I'm looking at this and I'm like, well, I mean, it's not a miracle if they make the play. I mean, it would not be shocking. I will not be shocked if they make the playoffs. I will not be shocked if they don't make the playoffs. It really won't shock me either way. But if they do, then you're looking at nearly a week two two weeks and a half off before they play their first playoff game. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. It's wild. Um, it is the way that the FIFA calendar is set up and the FIFA calendar is what it is, but um, you know, no way, no way advocating for like a shorter schedule to get that end of the season in before the playoffs. But here's what I will advocate for is uh, like an NFL late season uh, option where, uh, you know, now that everything is under Apple, um, where they switch the game to like the Sunday night game because it's going to be a big game. Like Apple, you got the, you know, Apple would certainly want to see, you know, two, two teams 
fighting it out. Well, I guess New York isn't really fighting it out the way we are, but you know, uh, two, 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 two teams in the playoff spot hunt, decision day, you know, that it, it's, it's better for the storylines to see DC play win or lose than it is uh, for us to be sitting on the sidelines on decision day. Yeah. Um, real quick, wanted to also touch base. Congratulations to Ben Olson winning the Open Cup. Um, you look at, I look at Houston and I'm like, man, you talk about some like parallels as far as ownership, as far as general fan apathy that was sort of developing. And they, so many people laughed at the hiring of Ben Olson. So many people. And I think what they're learning is, I think what we've learned is that he was a really good coach. I think there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of talk about fans being like, well, he wasn't really the problem. We were also upset. I think we were on the show and I think some people have put out a good point. It's like, you know, it's it, two things can be true. It can be very true that sort of his time was up at DC. I think he needed a refresh. I think he was burnt out. Um, I think he needed some time away. And, you know, also it can be true too that, you know, ownership is still a problem. And and part of the reason he was burnt out was trying to put up with everything that had been going on with this team and, and, you know, the, yeah, everything with Acosta. And I mean, I'm getting real, it's getting real tired of watching players that you used to root for. You used to cheer for players. You got jerseys on the back of your name. I have an Acosta jersey. It's getting real tired watching those guys go out and be successful. And you're watching your and your coaches and everything like that. And you're looking at your team and it's like, why can't we have at least some of that? Like, why can't we just be, why can't we be friggin' Nashville? Why can't we be, I don't even want to say Columbus. Why can't we be new England? Like new England, they, I mean, they've had a good run. They've had a good season, but like I, at this point, like I don't even care. I don't even care about being top of the league at this point. I just want like a good team that's competitive that's competent. And every year it's not like the same issues over and over again, which is here. It's the thing. It's depth. It's like they passed past the 11. Now we have nobody. And it's like, I, I just keep scratching my head. Like, how are we in this situation? Year in, year out. It doesn't change. It's never changed. There's, every year we have the same conversation. There's, there's one constant Ted. No, it's Dave Casper. Exactly. <laughs> All right, folks. I think it's going to do it. a little bit of a late, late running show, but, uh, Thank you, Brian, for stepping in, and uh, we will hopefully have a very healthy John back uh, next Monday to close out the season. Maybe it'll be the the end of the the end of the road, the end of the line. Uh, maybe we'll be talking about decision day permutations. Who knows, man? This this has been a a weird. I think weird year is a good re- year to good way to describe this. This has been a weird year for a number of reasons, not just the game, not just the games on the field, but all the stuff off the off the field as well. Thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you guys uh, next week. Vamos. Vamos. Vamos.